Hello again, welcome back. Um, so this morning we've had uh, several sp uh, talks giving us inspiration in the first part of the morning, then we went to have a look at uh, Know Your Customer and re Security, and now we are going to get our hands onto how to design APIs uh, for great customer experience, and we're going to start this with uh, John Scheel. He's an API strategist, and he's going to talk to us about uh, governments and how to choose the best model. A warm applause, please, for John. Thank you very much for, for joining me. I'm very excited to be here in, in London. Um, as you probably know from the title, I'm, I'm also the, the organizer of API Days in Singapore. We, we ran for the first time uh, in April this year. Uh, similar number of, of people as, as here, similar focus on, on financial services, and uh, would, uh, would welcome any of you to, to join us next April when we, we run uh, API Days again. <coughs> I, um, I'm going to talk to you now about what I regard as the, the dirty little secret of APIs, because people, when, when they start to talk about APIs, they think about reuse and agility and uh, how you can partner at scale, and all of that is, is really exciting, um, but it, there are some hard parts to it. The, it's not all, all glossy. You don't necessarily want to partner with everyone. Uh, you need to have some uh, criteria about selecting. You need to balance, you need to balance uh, centralised, uh, centralized control with, uh, with, with decentralized uh, execution. You need to have some guidelines, uh, but you also want to encourage innovation. So I'm, I'm going to give you, uh, give you an introduction. I, I won't give you an one answer because there is not one answer. There is not one size fits all for, for every organization, but I'll give you a, a hint to some of the, the trade-offs that there are you, when, uh, to help you to uh, create your own governance framework for your organization. So, uh, where are we going to click here? Okay, first uh, definition. I have to tell you, don't, don't look at this. I put this up, I know it's busy, I know it's straight after lunch and you really don't want to focus that much. Um, I, I will go through this in, in a little bit more detail, but what I like to think of as, as governance is uh, not as complicated as that. I, I like to keep it a little simpler. Governance should be, um, should make it easy for people to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. I, I, I think um, you, if you have that in the back of your mind, then you, you, you some way, you, you've understood the purpose of, of governance. Governance needs to help the organisation to manage change. There are some things that need more control than, than others. Um, there it also needs th to help the organisation sustain the ongoing operations um, and ensure that what was deployed uh, continues to be, um, to be viable. So if I, can, if I can talk a little bit about the goals of, of governance, um, to, to break it down a little bit, you want to maximise the value of the partner ecosystem that, uh, that you're, uh, you're fostering and, and creating. You want to provide some guidance both to your internal staff and to partners about what, what your organisation's priorities are and also um, what, what, you, what you want to foster. And then the degree of autonomy that people have in what they can, what, what they, they actually can do and what are some of the compliance aspects that um, they, they must address and need to uh, protect the, uh, the firm and all, all the customers, the, the data uh, uh, financially and, and their, uh, their identity. And you need to comply with regulations, so simply having a great idea it doesn't mean that, uh, particularly in a regulated industry like financial services, you need to uh, uh, address the, the regulatory compliance and there may be 
um, particularly if you're a, a large institution, you already have um, people, teams who are dedicated to, uh, to engaging with regulators. And so if you have uh, APIs, you need to engage with, with those people. So the challenges, I think the, one of the principal challenges in defining um, a API governance is uh, Conway's law. So you may have heard of, about Conway's law. It's an idea that an organization that starts to build systems is going to build it in the image of the organization. If you have a um, retail banking segment uh, and a corporate banking segment, you're probably going to end up with systems that serve the retail bank and the corporate bank. Now, I actually think APIs are a great opportunity to help break down those, those silos because you, um, you can define the, the flows of information between um, parties within, within the organisation. It can help promote uh, reuse and collaboration across the, the organisation. But you, you should still recognise that the organisation has grown up this, this way. Uh, systems have been developed by different, uh, by different departments because of the way the, the organisation structure uh, has, has evolved. And then, as I mentioned, the, the challenge of centralisation versus decentralisation. If you have a highly centralised decision-making process, you can uh, get the benefits of standardisation, but there are, also, um, the, there are also costs to that. The, the idea of being more, more agile is much harder if, you, um, if you're going to constrain the decision making to just one group or one body. And also, the, the very pace of change, what seems like a um, best practice today, could very easily be considered obsolete. We heard this morning um, Gavin Littlejohn talking about the screen scraping of um, uh, being used for account aggregation, which 20 years ago seemed like a, a good idea and is now considered uh, highly, highly vulnerable. So you need to be able to evolve uh, your, your API governance in, in the light of, of new, newer technologies and, uh, and new ways of, of, of doing business. So it's um, this, this trade-off um, between, uh, between making a decision now and, and having to revise it, you, you really need to... Um, you really need to consider the implications of how you structure your, your governance. So, I'm going to talk a bit about the, uh, the API lifecycle. Different people in the, in the organisation are going to want to create and publish APIs. You're going to want to um, realise that is actually launch and, uh, and get the value from them. You need to be able to maintain them and you need to decide when to, when to retire them. Now, this, is, this has similarities with any other um, uh, technology asset. You need to, you need to recognise the life cycle to it. But the, uh, you also need to understand, well, who, 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 gets, to get, who gets to create these? Who owns the, the API? You could say, well, perhaps the, the owner of the underlying data or, or service should own the, the API. But then how do you... Um, how do you make sure that, that that API has been designed and built in um, in a sustainable way? Uh, how do you... Uh, who's going to decide who gets to consume that? We, we heard a little bit about um, partners and uh, in the, in the um, main auditorium there's discussion about fostering a, a partner ecosystem, par uh, partnerships at, at scale, but uh, particularly in a regulated environment you need to be careful about who you're going to, to partner with. Uh, and then who decides, who's going to monitor and maintain? Uh, you, could, you could argue that if a particular team, uh, an autonomous team, has created a service and exposed it with an API, then they, they are the, uh, the logical custodians of that. But if you, the, the more you move into a, a microservices type of architecture, the more you changes at, at one part of that, um, that architecture are going to have a, a ripple effect to, to others. You have performance challenges that an individual team may not be able to e even recognise, let alone address. So there's a, there's a need for uh, understanding 
who in, in the organisation is going to have an overall view of, of what's going on. And then who gets to uh, decide how to retire uh, an API and what happens after that. So a, a typical organisation for a um, small scale team is you have uh, a, a team may <coughs> be um, created a, a service and expose it through an API. A very, very lightest form would be the developer of the API, the administrator of, of the service and, and an owner of that, maybe a business owner or maybe a team leader. And then the, the API consumer may be inside the organisation or, or a partner firm and the, and the end consumer. I think um, Paul Rohan uh, this morning described a little bit about that, um, that, that sort of ecosystem. So the, um, each has a part to play and it looks relatively simple. But when you, when you scale that up a little bit and you have multiple teams um, creating and publishing APIs, then you have to start thinking, well, for to, to aid reuse, you need to make sure that it's discoverable. So you should have a centralised uh, developer portal where, uh, where APIs get, get published and you should have a team that, that manages that. And having, um, that there are different skill sets required to, to manage that function. So you start to see that uh, the, the team model makes sense to, to look after the platform, but you still have to balance, well, how much is going to be done by the centralised team and how much are you going to devolve to, to each of the, the product teams. When you get to a, a, um, a large enterprise, in addition to that framework where you have different um, product teams and, and an API team, then you've also got a lot of different stakeholders. So if you decide, if you, you say, okay, I'm going to treat APIs as a product, then you, you should be thinking about, well, who are the, uh, you should be thinking then in marketing terms. Uh, a, ma a product manager of another type of product would be thinking about who, who is the customer, their, their profile, if your customer is a developer in, in this case. Then, um, and if the uh, the service is is a core competence of the firm, then the same sort of people who um, who create uh, a deposit product or a lending product or, or other types of products will will be wanting to have a, a say. The line of business needs to needs to be um, involved, and then the risk management functions, the the tech information security, uh, and and even finance teams need to need to understand if you um, if you're going to monetize through the through the API well the finance team are going to want to understand well how are you actually billing for this Do you have the mechanism to trace that so there are a lot more players the the larger you scale this within within your organization and figuring out who's um, who's responsible for what and who gets to do um, their work to, towards their, their own aims uh, is, is a question you need to, need to address. So I want to go back to the, um, the definition that I showed earlier. I think it makes a little bit more sense if we break it down a little bit further. It's a little less scary. I've shown you some other diagrams. So, um, so we, in order to define the, the governance, you need to think about what are the, the what are the policies, principles, policies, and standards you're going to follow. That it needs to be continuously monitored. It's not something that's one and done. You don't just set it up. I, I think also Paul mentioned um, the challenge of how organisations think of deploying a new technology as a project is uh, presents a, a challenge because you do need to be able to um, sustain and and uh, evolve the capability uh, as you go so who's going to be um, who's going to be who's going to monitor this and then who's going to be the governing body that uh, that actually addresses this is it going to be a um, a single team or are you going to have representatives from across uh, different product teams and how are you going to balance uh, balance those things and who gets to vote uh, and uh, who gets to, to veto 
and how, how do you make sure that you can align, that you maintain alignment with the organization strategy? So I, I think when, when you break it down like that, then this definition doesn't seem quite so scary. Uh, that you, you start to pick, out, pick apart the, the pieces to that. So when we talk about the, um, the, the artifacts, the, uh, that is the, the documentation, the, the things that you, you may, um, you should think about specifying. So firstly is principles because uh, establishing rules is, is, is um, may address your immediate needs but sooner or later something is going to come along that doesn't fit into the nice little rule, set of rules that, that you've defined. So you need to have some guiding principles around uh, what, how you will govern uh, your, your API capability. You need to set some policies. So if, for example, you, um, you, you might decide that you're going to make your, your developer portal available to, to anyone to register their own account, uh, but, uh, and, and you get, enable them uh, users to self-register, create their own app and test it against uh, your, your test APIs, well, the next step is what, what happens then? And you need a policy and a process to, to be able to take um, from the, the developer portal through to production. And you need to be clear about what that's going to be. Standards, you can decide to standardize on, on uh, certain API um, design standards, or, and, or you can also decide that you want to um, stick with certain languages for things, or you, you may decide to leave that up to um, the, uh, the different teams and, and partners to develop their, their own. Style guides, we'll talk a little bit about um, a style guide, I'll have an e example later, but the style guide can make um, your API documentation so much clearer. The trouble is, if you're going to specify a style guide, you have to decide, uh, are you going to mandate that as, as necessary? You have to follow the, the style guide, or are you going to treat it more like a, a suggestion and, and education? And you need to educate people about how how they're going to apply the style guides. Patterns, uh, useful ways of, of applying, of, of how, say, uh, an authentication or authorization sequence should take place, and anti-patterns, some things that you're certainly not going, to, not going to approve. So there are benefits to standardization. It gives you clarity of purpose. Um, it helps you to prioritize what, the, what aligns well with the organization's strategy and it promotes uh, reusability and simplifies your risk management because you're only going to um, check against whether it, whether it meets the standard. But the costs are in actually creating these, these artifacts to begin with and educating the wider organisation on how to, uh, how to use and apply them. If you're going to um, be, be very strict in your enforcement, well, there's, there's a cost to that also. And there's... Uh, if you are strict on enforcement, then you're going to have to recognise that there'll be perhaps less innovation than there would have otherwise been. So I want to use as, as an example the, the partner or onboarding process. So you've got, um, you've had perhaps the, um, a developer portal, you've published your APIs to that, you've allowed uh, users to register their own their own user account um, and test their their apps against these, these test APIs. Well, the what happens next part is uh, is more contentious, particularly for a, for a regulated entity. Uh, you you have to decide. Well, firstly, the a developer has come to me. And they say they've got an app that uses our API. Is this somebody that um, we we really want to uh, we want to deal with? Are they a regulated entity than themselves? In the uh, the UK's open banking uh, implementation, uh, a fintech, a, a player should needs to um, needs to register as uh, as an entity. And then, what is what is sort of the business model you're going to adopt with with them? The um, then you need to gauge the technical readiness now. Ideally, you wouldn't have to create new test cases. You, you should actually think 
when you when you create an API, well, what are the test cases you want to run against uh, this this API when uh, either an internal team or a, or a partner comes and um, uh, and 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 wants to access your production APIs? You need to create a, a, a test environment, uh, whitelist them, conduct end to end, end testing. So there's a conducting the technical readiness and then and then the actual commercial launch uh, it's um, if you want the if you want the partner to benefit and uh, and and your own organization to benefit then you really need to be thinking thinking about how you're going to communicate the um, the the value of, of that of that whole thing so some of these steps can be automated and others you really need to decide am I going to have a human or multiple uh, approval steps before I get to the next stage. So I want to show you um, one example of how you might uh, of how you might work this out, and who decides what um, what happens at each point. Now I've used a a big a large enterprise example because I think that's that points to the the challenges, particularly. Be since large or enterprises already have uh, different groups that are responsible for different types of, of, of governance of, of technology. And the, um, you, you really want to, I, I'm not being prescriptive here, this is just an example of, of how an organisation might decide that they're going to make uh, different groups responsible, accountable, uh, consulted or informed about what happens at each stage activity within within the API lifecycle. There's no right or wrong answer here. And a small organization would probably and particularly in an un unregulated industry would probably be able to simplify this a great deal. So to give you one one example, and it's not financial services, but it is uh, but it is a pretty established industry. Um, Amadeus is a, a global distribution system for, for airline travel and they, they've been uh, publishing APIs for, for some time. They, they've developed this, this governance structure around having um, a, a body of members representing the organisation as, as a whole and, um, and specifying down to the style guides and educating educating users how to um, how to how to apply them. So I, I want to rather than give you an answer, just uh, give you some some key considerations to think about how to how to decide what is the right uh, governance structure for you. It needs to you have to think about what your organisation is is right now. Um, and what you propose to, to be, the, the, um, the organisational structure, how, uh, how, how work gets done, how you want to engage across the community, the, the internal community and the external community, whether you want to be more of a, a catalyst or coach for, uh, for API development or whether you, you want to have um, very strict rules about what can and cannot be done, and the degree of automation that you think you can achieve uh, in that, that whole, whole process. So I want to leave you with uh, perhaps just a couple of references. I have uh, an article that I've written that sort of explains that in a little bit more text. And uh, I would also recommend highly the, uh, the book Continuous API Management, which is uh, co-authored by the founder of API Days. Thanks very much. <laughs>